Well, I'm glad you're here. If you'll stand up, I'm going to read our scripture text of the day, and we'll get into it, okay? All right. So I'm going to read the scripture verse, and then I'll pray. Matthew 6, through 34 says, But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day ha- has enough trouble of its own, and we all said, it does, right? <laughs> all right. Well, Lord, we thank you, Father, for um, allowing us to be in community today, to be part of the family of God, to stand here in a room with brothers and sisters that we don't even know sometimes. And uh, we thank you for that. I pray, Father, that you would um, inspire us, Lord, in our journey with you, to be close to you, Lord, to trust you, to have eyes to see what you're doing and eyes to see you and ears to hear what you're doing and ears to hear you speak to us, Lord. We thank you for it today. Draw us to your heart. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you can be seated. Um, there's a story, if you've been, I think I tell this all the time, but it's just so funny because if you have children, you know that children will humble you. Do you amen? All right, they will humble you. Okay, so um, we have three children. They're all very, very different. And our first child when she was born was very, very um, gentle, very sweet, very kind. She loved to please. In fact, at nine months old, I was done with the crib because if you know me, I like change, right? I was done with the crib. I wanted to get her a bigger bed. I'm like, Taylor, she's the one who was singing on the end here today. I was like, Taylor, at nine months old, I I feel like it's a miracle now. I didn't then, but it was a miracle. And I'd say, Taylor, now mama's going to go to sleep. And I was already pregnant by the time this happened, I think. And I'd say, you know, Taylor, like, you sit here, and when my mama wakes up, she'll come and get you, and we'll eat breakfast. And Taylor's like, yes, because she loves to please, right? It's like, oh, yeah, she didn't move, you know? And then, um, and she was always super grateful and just really, yeah, easy, you know? And then I had Mackenzie, and I've never been able to name and identify this child because she was at a place in life, I don't know if she'd appreciate it or a damager, but now we laugh about it so I can say this. Then I have Mackenzie who was born and immediately in the hospital was bossing me. You know what I'm saying? Like she was screaming at me and I didn't know what to do for her. And um, it would take a while before she'd get words to tell me what it was she wanted me to do for her. And so I remember one time we were at, um, we were at Sam's Club and she is a planner. She's always wanting to know what's about to happen, or she gets excited to make plans. And, and I remember us standing in an aisle and her saying, you know, I just, I don't know what I'm going to be when I grow up. Like, seriously. And I'm like, baby, you got plenty of time. You're like three or four. You know, I don't remember what she was. I'm like, you got plenty of time. And so then I'm going to go with it, right? I'm like, oh, you want to be a ballerina? No, I don't want to be a ballerina. Well, what do you want to be? Like, do you want to, do you want to, be in kids church because she just loved kids church and the helpers and you know they get crushes and things like that like where they just want to do things and be like the bigger kids right and so I was like well you could work in kids church she's like no you know what if I can't figure it out I'll just I'll do like you and just be nothing so (laughs) it's good because when Kinsey was born I mean honestly I became her assistant Like she would, you know, Taylor would sit in her bed till I'd wake up and make breakfast. Mackenzie, somehow we have, I mean, I don't even know, I think we have video of Mackenzie in her crib, um, like walking along the rails, like, you know, doing her thing. She was like a gold medal hurdleist when she was little. So I feel like in the morning, somehow she'd get out of her crib. She'd jump over the, the edge. She didn't literally, but that's what it felt like. And she'd come in my room in the darkness and she's trying to wake me up and she's smacking me in the face early in the morning. She's not waiting for me to get up and tell her, you know, anything or do anything for her. She is getting up and she's telling me how it's going to be because that's her nature. You know, she's like, oh, life's exciting. This is like, what are we going to do? You know, 
And I remember even when she was super little being like, okay, so what's our plan for the day? What are we going to do? And I, I, there, you couldn't say you don't know because that was like panicking, you know. And then, so that was Mackenzie. And then I had Noah. So you know mothers, if you have multiples, they're all so different. And then I had Noah, who I was exhausted from being Mackenzie's, um, you know, you know, assistant, and he just made life funny. Like, he was just funny. He'd just do funny things. It became a problem as he got older, but when he was little, it was super cute, right? Very, very cute. And so, um, a lot of laughter in our home, a lot of seasons where they adored me, and seasons where they have not liked me very much. And um, a lot of seasons where, you know, it was good. I remember being little, or I was little once, but that's not what I'm remembering. I remember when the kids were little, we'd go into public and people would even say, your kids are so well behaved. Oh, and then one time we were at the, on Washington Road at the um, McDonald's and a girl was like, your kids are so sweet. They helped my little boy up the slide. Like they love each other. They're taking care of each other. And then, you know, fast forward, a few years, they hated each other, and they're screaming at each other, and I'm thinking, but what time people said you were so cute, and you were so sweet, and you were so kind, you know, lots of seasons that make you proud, and seasons that break your heart as a mother, as a parent, but let me tell you, God has a purpose for us as people. Motherhood is a season. It goes for our whole life. But, but when we have our children with us, it is a season. But it is so important for us to know who we are beyond our titles. Amen? It's so important. And so um, we're going to look today in Matthew 6. So if you have your Bible, I love it when we have our Bibles. It helps me so much. But Matthew 6, I was actually reading Matthew 5 Um, last week, it takes me eternity to get through scripture because I have a lot of questions and I investigate and do all the things. So I've been in Matthew 5 for a while. And when Reagan um, asked me to speak today, it was a couple of weeks ago, and I was in Matthew already. And I knew immediately, I knew immediately the scripture. It just came to me like, seek ye first the kingdom of God, you know. And so I knew exactly that's what I was going to do. But I've been enjoying where I was in Scripture. So this week I was, got into 6, and I'm reading, reading chapter 6. And then finally, I'm like, i got to put this down because i got to prep for talking on Sunday, right? And so I um, Google, like every good Christian does, where is Seek Ye First the King? Like some of you know where addresses of Bible Scriptures are, and some of us don't. That's okay. We can figure it out, right? So I Google, like, Seek Ye First, and it took me Matthew 6. The chapter I'm actually in in the Bible is the very last verse, and I just hadn't made it there yet. And so um, I'm excited to share with you because Matthew uh, 5 and 6 are so fresh on my heart, and what Jesus is doing is so beautiful in the Scripture. And so we're going to start with um what Jesus, the context, because I always like context. Um, I don't want to bog you down with all the details, but there's a context that's really cool to me because Jesus, this is when he's teaching on the mount. And what happens is, is Jesus sees a multitude and he's kind of moved with compassion on the multitude. Um, If you look into Luke, another time where he's preaching sort of the same sermon, It's not the same time, but it's the same sermon he's preaching to a group of people. It talks about what he saw when he saw a multitude. And this is what Jesus saw when he saw a multitude. multitude. He sees them, and it says they're demon-possessed people. There are people who need to be healed. So there's tormented people. There are people who need to be healed. And they're just in awe of the power that Jesus has to deliver. Okay, And so Jesus sits down, and he begins to teach them. The word taught used a lot of times especially with this particular um, sermon that Jesus is preaching, is actually a word that means it's like rep- repetitive and habitual, okay? And so this is a, this is a, these are teachings that Jesus taught a lot of places that he went. This was Jesus's declaration of the kingdom. This for Jesus was like the good news. Like when we talk about the good news of the gospel, often we think about like the good news is that Jesus came, he died for us while we were sinners. Well, Jesus had good news before he even died and that was there were there was a time span where it was they the people were in darkness even the people of God they didn't have a prophet speaking to them it was they were longing for a savior and here comes Jesus but in this time the religious of the day 
had built in a lot of rules. We talk about that a lot, a lot of rules. They had, they had figured, you know, like any parent does, honestly, you know, <laughs> I have done this, where it's like, there's this good Bible truth, right? We have this good truth, but our kids need us to kind of help them figure out what wisdom looks like, right? And so we start to say, this is wisdom. This is what wisdom looks like, right? And so maybe you just do this. But what happens is, is when you start to tell people what to do, sometimes you're not letting them figure it out with the Lord, right? And so what happens is, is they begin to make rules and, and um, calling it like God ordained or rules like this. And what happens is, is people became, become um, spiritual, spiritually toxic. They're kind of like spiritual curators, right? I don't know if I said that very Southern or if it's right, but you know, a curator is someone who works in a, an art gallery or something and they position the pictures just right and they make sure that what is seen looks the way that they want it to look. And so back in the day, before Jesus comes, there's a lot of spiritual posturing that has taken place in Israel. And it's spiritual posturing on the part of the Pharisees and the religious, the people of God, um, the Hebrew God. And then there's also a posturing that's taking place with the, the non-Jews, the pagans of that day. And they are people, so you have the hip, the, we're going to read in chapter 6, and Jesus is going to talk about hypocrites, he's going to talk about pagans. And pagans are people who believe in a God or gods, maybe they're polytheistic and believe in a lot of gods. They're people who believe in gods, but they're constantly trying to get attention from God. Like if I just do this, like I've seen it work for other people. And so if I do this, maybe pagans would often cut themselves or wail out or babble or go into trances because that spiritual act made them feel like God is surely going to see me. And some of the Jewish people had kind of gotten into that. But there were a lot of Gentiles who were like that. And so Jesus at, as, is going to be speaking to the crowd, but it makes me think that when he s sees the crowd and he's moved with compassion, he's moved with compassion because he sees people groups within the crowd who are striving, who are working so hard. And Jesus knows the good news is not that they have to strive and work incredibly hard, but that he wants relationship with them. You see, Jesus, when he's talking about the, the hypocrites and the pagans we're about to go into, when he's talking about that, he's not saying, it's not a we and them thing. Like, this is what they do. It's not like, you know, this feud that's going on between Jesus and the Pharisees. The Pharisees definitely had beef with Jesus, and Jesus had beef with their practices. But he also said, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, right? It wasn't about those people, but he's, he's setting a picture that if you're a parent, you kind of know, like you'll, you'll compare not to build walls between people, but to tear down some walls, to bring in some truth. And so that's what Jesus is doing. Jesus is painting a picture not to divide the, the ones following him to make them think they're better than the people in the crowd who are posturing these pagans and hypocrites. He's not doing that to build walls. He's actually comparing to tear down the walls that separate his people from himself because they've got the wrong idea. Okay? So if we look at Matthew and we start in Matthew uh, 6, 1 through 4, Jesus is teaching here and he's talking about, he's talking about giving to the needy. And they're going to flash some scriptures up there. I'm going to do the joy version. So you probably want to go back and read it to make sure you're getting the whole thing. I'm going to summarize so that we can get through information. But basically, Jesus here is talking about giving to the needy. Because his people were supposed to give to the needy. And what had happened was, is, is the posturing of the religious had made it a show. And so Jesus is like, don't do that. Because... God has a reward for you if you do that and it's between you and him. Get alone. Do it behind closed doors. Be in secret. And then the next part of chapter 5 is about prayer. And then he says, don't be like the hypocrites. Don't be like these posturing, curating um, spiritualists here. Don't do that. It says they love to be really loud in the synagogues. They like to, to, to make a big show of their prayers. You know, don't, don't do that. In fact, the pagans babble and they're just begging for attention from God. Don't do that because your father knows what you need. Come into a secret place. Come and know me and seek me first. It goes back to that scripture. 
And then he's going to talk about fasting. He's like, don't make a show of fasting. That's what the hypocrites do. That's what they do. Not to build a wall and say we're better than the hypocrites. But they're striving and there's a better way. There's good news for you. Okay? And so we have a video here um, of some of our moms here at New Hope. And it's, it's really sweet. And we're going to take a look at it. For mothers who know what it's like to find who they are outside of their title. Before Christ, I would describe myself as a hot mess. Hot mess. Selfish and darkness. Making it easier to cho choose joy, because there are a lot of days when I'm just drained and tired and I don't feel like it, um, but you have to choose um, certain things like joy and love and kindness. Now knowing his character, I know his, his desires are for me to live in community and to be known and um, to know others and to be outside of myself and be outward focused. And I come from a background of being abandoned as a child. Um, and then I was adopted and then I was um, in a home where my parents divorced. And so after all of that, as a young adult coming into a relationship with Christ, I more than anything just wanted to belong. And that is absolutely what um, Christ Christ has done for me is giving me a sense of belonging and knowing that I was created on purpose for a purpose. Felt like it was just going to be this like beautiful experience and they were going to be obedient children and ideas of just endless cuddles and beautiful memories and laughter. Kind of a dream world. Um, oh, this is what I'm going to do. This is the way I will raise my kid. This is what I will be addressing her like this, that all those stuff. I probably realized it when Theo's first word was no. Motherhood actually, in fact, is those things. However, I wasn't anticipating the challenges um, and how the challenges would lead me to feeling inadequate. Just um, not only as a mom, but kind of as a person. You don't realize the weight. You don't know until you know. You know, soon you're, you're going to be responsible for this real life human and all of their needs and everything, it's, it's a little terrifying. It's probably one of the most difficult yet rewarding jobs there is. They brought my daughter to me. When I looked at her, her eyes were open. And the minute I looked at her eyes, I realized that um, it's not that what I thought of how a motherhood will be. I realized that now I have this soul in my hand and um, I will be the sole responsible person for this life. I felt that um, my responsibility, my role is not simply helping her, but raising her in a, in a godly way. When I was outnumbered by these little people and then babies three and four came along, I quickly realized I was in over my head and I could not do it alone. <laughs> It made me realize, though, that I utterly, absolutely had to depend on God. And if I was going to be a parent the way that God wanted me to parent, I was going to have to be equipped with the Word. It's so desperate for the Lord. It has made me realize that I truly am weak and I have to lean into the Lord. You learn that, that it's not all about you you learn it's a matter of, of giving things over and trusting. And that means your, your children, the problems, all of it. And there's been many times where I've had to just say, God, I can't do with this. It's just too much. You're gonna have to help me with it. I can't do it by myself. My prayer is more for my grandchildren, that they would, um, find the Lord at an early age and live for Him all their lives. At this point of motherhood, I'm just hoping to finish the race well. <laughs> we have four teenagers that need to, to grow up and to start their own families. Um, my biggest prayer right now is just constant discernment. Um, when should I be really strict and disciplined with my children? And when should I offer a lot more grace? Don't, God, please don't let me fail as a mother. 
just um, give me the courage, give me the wisdom and understanding when they go through situations and help them. Let them have a deep and um, strong understanding of their value in Christ. That they know Jesus at an early age, that they love the Bible, um, and that they never forget who they are, the children of God, and um, that they are confident in Him who lives in them. That they have their own individual relationships with Christ, that they seek Him, that they know that their identity is in Him, and that um, they, you know, are going to be the types of husbands and wives and the type of parents that um, seek God first in their own relationships. A theme that we heard a lot was trust. Amen. And trusting the Lord with our children, trusting the Lord in general. In fact, whenever... Um, they were asked about what they're praying for their children. You'll notice they didn't put, um, they didn't say, oh, I am praying that they really nail motherhood, you know, <laughs> or that they're just awesome professionals. You know what they said? I want them to develop a relationship with the Lord. I want them to know God because here's the, the thing is that every mother is a daughter, every son, every father is a son. All of us, when we have relationship with the Lord, our identity has shifted into all the, the roles, all the things that we, we want to define ourselves by now comes under the fact that we are the children of God he is the Father, and we can trust Him, right? And then when you know that, that becomes your prayer for those that you love. You know, right now, I am not praying about um, my children in terms of like, oh, just help them get the right career, because I believe that if they'll cultivate a God-first life, what that looks like for them is that God is going to lead them. The most important thing for me is that they develop that relationship that points them in the direction that the Holy Spirit is leading them. Because really, I love my children, but God loves them more. I can only do and see so much, but God sees it all, and he's drawing them into places that I cannot draw them. In fact, the Bible says the Holy Spirit draws is drawing us into all truth when we know him, right? And so that is, that is what, as a mother, that is what I want. Um, let's look at Matthew 6, 19 through 24. And I'm going to linger in this portion of Scripture because I believe that this is a specific directive that the Lord really um, put on my heart to say for the house today. So let's start at the top of 19. Okay, do not store up for yourselves treasure on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And let's put this next part right before our eyes, in our pocket, because we're going to be referring back to this. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If the light within you is darkness, how great is the darkness? That's pretty rough. If the light inside of us is darkness, that's great darkness, right? It makes me think of a sermon I heard years ago. Um, some of the staff went to a leadership conference. It was... Um, it was Catalyst Conference in Atlanta, and Andy Stanley spoke. And he had a session that was that where he talked about Esau. Now, Esau was the son of Isaac, who was the son of Abraham. We all we all kind of know who Abraham is. Abraham had um, a son, Isaac and Ishmael. Isaac had twin boys. Okay. One was Esau, that was the oldest by a hair, like just, I mean, they were twins, so he was the oldest. And then there was Jacob. Now, is in, in Hebrew culture, that firstborn has a special birthright, has a special, he has a special blessing. And so Esau was the son of birthright and blessing. And 
what happened was, is Esau was also known to be a bit of a wild man. He was a bit of a rebel. In fact, um, in scripture, it even alludes to the fact that he went against his parents and even was, you know, um, seeing girls outside of their faith where he was specifically told not to do that. He did his own thing. Esau was very much led by his own hungers. And so what happens is, is you have Jacob, who's a bit more strategic, a bit more domestic, and I am not a hunter, and I don't know all the things about hunting, but I do know that Esau would go out and hunt, and he would come home. I'm sure that Jacob noticed a pattern. He goes out, and he hunts for a day, two, I don't know how long you hunt, and then they come home, right? And they're really hungry because it's been a lot of work, and so Jacob makes a stew. It's a, I'm abbreviating this a very good story, long story. But he makes stew because he knows Esau is led by his hunger. He's led by what he wants, and he's impatient, and he really lacks seeing the big picture. And so Jacob, he makes the stew. Esau comes in, and Esau, because he's hungry, now his hunger makes everything feel magnified and exaggerated. Because Esau's like, if I can't eat that stew, like if I can't eat, I'm going to die. We've all done that. I mean, honestly, right? <laughs> you know, get a little hungry. I'm like, whoa, I'm not used to being hungry. I just go from meal to meal, you know? But here's the thing, like he comes in, he's hungry, and Jacob already knows, like, he's got him because he's got a plan. So Jacob says, well, you want this stew? I'll give you the stew, but you're going to give me your birthright. And because Esau is a person who lacks vision for the big picture, Esau is like, give it to me. And he trades his birthright for what he's hungry for. And let me tell you this, being human means that we have a bundle of appetites, and your appetite, my appetite might look different. I might really crave success in life in a way you don't crave. I may approach relationships and need things out of relationships you don't need. But let me tell you, all of us are people with appetites. But we're also, when we know the Lord, we are people who have birthright and we have promise that God has for us. And what the enemy wants to do in our lives is he wants to get us so fixated on the thing that we want that like Esau, the scripture says he actually despised his birthright. Doesn't that sound like that scripture? It says you can't have two masters. Either you're going to hate one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both, both God and money. Money is a hunger. So if you're so hungry that you take God out of first place and you decide this is what I want, then you'll begin to despise what tells you that you cannot have that thing. That's, that's our nature. And Jesus knows that. And he's coming to them in the spirit of this is good news for you. Because what he's saying is what's done in secret, what's done between you and him, the obedience, the righteousness, the holiness that is played out and the devotion that we give to our God in secret is going to be able to give us perspective for the big picture. Amen? And so what we see is Esau has traded his stew. He has traded his birthright for a bowl of stew. Sounds ridiculous, but it happened. And he would live in strife he would, be, uh, he would be a man, kind of a wild man, his whole life. Let's look at Matthew 6. Let's move forward. Because Jesus now is telling us how to lean into a God-first life. What does it look like? And he's trying to encourage people who need courage to believe him. We're, he's in a place where there are people who literally are hungry. There are people who, who have diseases that they don't go to a doctor. They can't be healed. And Jesus is encouraging them. And he's saying, don't worry. Like, don't worry. Have you ever had to say that to people in your life, whether it's friend, it's kids, it's a spouse, like, don't worry. You're, you know, sometimes I get more stressed out about the fact that I'm going to get stressed out. Does anybody do that? Like, I can get nervous that I'm going to be worried, so I actually worry about being worried. 
So then I try to control my life in a way that makes sure that I don't, I don't have to deal with my worry. It's ridiculous. And so Jesus knows there is a tension with us when it comes to worry. And so he's talking to them and he says, you know, don't worry about what you're going to eat or drink or you're going to wear. The kingdom of God is about so much more than that. And he, he compares it to birds. He talks about the flowers, how he, he is the provider in nature and also that we don't have to worry. And then it leads us to our theme verse, verses 33 through 34. We'll read it again. But seek first. Everybody say first. Thank you so much. All right. His kingdom and his righteousness and all these things. Everybody say all these things. I don't like when people make me do that, but I do feel like it's good to say it. All right. All right. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And so we're going to look at, practically speaking, what is God, what does it mean? How do we, practically speaking, order our life in such a way that God is first? And so I'm going to pull a Reagan. <laughs> I'm going to pull a Reagan because when we, when we leave church, my kids always remember when he's got like these three R's or whatever. So I'm going to do three R's, right? Okay, so there's three R's. Okay, when we seek first the kingdom of God, what does it look like, okay? So it looks like restructured priorities. It is not either choosing God or not choosing God. It's not about one or the other. It is literally about putting God before all others. That's why the scripture says seek first. It doesn't say seek only. Because we do a lot of things in life. We wear a lot of hats in life. We have jobs. We have roles. We, we're mothers. We're husbands. I mean, not all of us are those things, but you know what I mean. Like, we're more than just one thing in life. We have a lot of seasons in life, and we wear a lot of hats in life. And Jesus understands that. So he's saying, seek first. So what that looks like, if you think, you know, well, I think about the time that Reagan and I were in missions. We would spend our summers sometimes in a, doing a thing called Mission Adventures. And we would go to um, these Native American reservations up in South Dakota, in Rosebud, South Dakota. And you learn a lot about culture here or other places where you have um, what they consider like sacred places, right? And if you go in and you want to build, um, they will not let you build around a sacred place, right? And so in our lives, what Jesus is saying is, let's let what I say, let's let my word, let's let the position of my relationship with you, let that be a sacred space that you build your life around. And that's what Jesus wants. In a God-first life, that's what it looks like. It's not saying I'm denying everything in my life, but what it's saying is I will filter every decision I make how I mother her, how, how I do my job, it will be filtered through what Jesus says, what he says about me and how he says to live, okay? And so we restructure our priorities. Then secondly, we replace worry. We replace worry, replace it. Don't add faith to your worry, it doesn't work. We're, we love a good compartment. I love some compartments. You know, it helps me because I'm kind of like, my thinking is spaghetti-like. It's all just running together, you know. And so in life, to be successful, a lot of times I have to compartmentalize things so that I can figure out systems. But one thing that we cannot do is we cannot make room for faith in the midst of our worry. Because when we seek God first and we're alone with the Lord, what has to happen is we are transformed. Not coming to church, not getting in a program at church, not doing all the things other people talk about. That does not transform you. There is nothing that transforms you except for the Holy Spirit. He transforms you. And that has to be in a place where he is first and where you're alone and where you've cultivated listening to him and knowing who he is and in light of who he is, knowing who you are. We have to replace worry. And then we have to reposture our faith. Our identity has got to be first and foremost a child of God. I have to go into parenting Guys, I have to go in knowing who I am, 
because my kids love me and they're familiar with me. And there are times if I let my position as a mom define me, I fail all the time. I mean, we kind of have a joke sometimes. Like, I'm like, you know what? Why don't we go ahead and have our talks now so you don't have to go to a therapist? Like, what, is there anything that I'm doing that would be hurtful to you or like and me? And then we can joke about our personalities and we can have grace when, when you know, we kind of mess up. And because... I know that I am not every woman. It is not all in me. And the world tells us we can be every woman. And I like Whitney and I love her song. But we are not, we cannot do everything and nor are we called to do everything. God has strategically placed us into a family, into a family of God too, into community. And he has allowed us, in spite of our weaknesses, that he will become our strength and that his glory will be shown, right? And so um, there is a group called the Barna Group, and they, they have all these statistics on all the things. I don't, I don't know. Nobody's ever asked me a question. Do you ever think about that with stats? Like, nobody has ever asked me anything. But this, this group, this Barna Group, they go around and they poll people, especially when it comes to Christian topics. So they polled, you know, 100 um, women, and they were like, What is your first priority in life? What is the role that you feel like is the number one role of your life? 62% of Christian women said being a mother, which seems noble. I mean, you know, but I think it's 13% said their faith. That's a really low, if we're gonna seek first the kingdom of God, right? And I think 11% was, being a spouse and the rest was like being professional, had all these other little things. But it goes to show that if we are people who live and we haven't built around the sacred first spot of Jesus and we're finding our roles, no wonder we are incredibly frustrated and we feel like a failure and we feel like there's enough, not enough hours in the day. I heard a, I heard a lady one time or I read it, <laughs> something been a long time. I've been alive a while. And I read or heard this, but basically, you know, the lie is there's not enough hours in the day, but that's a lie. In fact, Jesus, Jesus even commands us to rest. And he promises us that when we rest, that we'll be, that the other six will be blessed. Wow. Jesus, him being first place empowers us to live in a way that we could not live without him. We are not smart enough. We are not wise enough. We don't have enough energy to do all the things. And so as women, we have got to reposture our faith. And as believers, we have absolutely got to reposture our faith. And then we're going to get to all these things. So that's what it looks like to put God first, right? Put God first. But then what are all these things that he's going to add to our life? Like, what are, what are these things? Because I know what I want him to do because I have a lot of hunger. Like, I have a lot of things I want. I have people, in fact, you know, Reagan was talking about hitting a deer last week, you know. And I have been a little grieved walking out and seeing deer hair in our grill. And a wopsided grill, you know. And we have 200, you know, thousand miles on our, our van, you know. And I think, well, it's probably about time for a vehicle. But then I'm like, oh, we can't because we got all these kids who are driving now. We thought it would be smart to have them all together, you know. And so now we have all this car insurance and making them work and trying to figure it out. And so now we're driving a, you know, deer van. So anyway. So it's easy for us, whether it's noble or not noble, to start putting our eyes and thinking that things of this world are going to cause us to be able to feel things we want to feel. Because at the end of the day, we've been married for almost 21 years, and we've had a few vehicles. And honestly, when I try to think back, the other day we were trying to think back through our cars, I couldn't even remember them all, you know. And so um, it's those things feel so urgent, but at the end of the day, those don't bring peace. So let's look at what all these things are that God promises us. So we need God's promises um, to shift us from temporary treasure to heavenly treasure. We need the Lord's perspective to know where to spend our time. Some of us are a slave to the things that we own. 
and we are spending our time working and doing things because we've got ourselves in a place where we had our eyes on this and now years later we're still paying for it and so then we have treasure that God's entrusted us with whether it's children or relationships but we have things that matter that we need to devote time to. We have to be able to have the time to even intentionally see what's going on and we don't have it. And what Jesus is saying is like, let's don't be so caught up spending our lives over something you're not gonna remember most of the time anyway. And let's focus on that heavenly treasure. What about number two is um, the if then mentality, you know? And that's basically if I have this, or if my kid, you know, I've said this before, if I could get them through, I remember when they were toddlers and we're just trying to keep them safe, you know, cause they're just, you know, everywhere. And I remember thinking, oh, if they could just get out of this phase. I could get, I could breathe, you know? And then they'd get out of that phase. And then um, I was un, unprepared for middle school, honestly. And, you know, middle school was a whole thing. And I thought, oh, if I could get them out of middle school, <laughs> Lord. And then they go to high school, you know? And honestly, there's beauty in all those places, but I had this mentality that everything was just going to calm down if. <laughs> and for you, that might be something else, you know? If you're single, it could be like, if I could finally get a, you know, girlfriend or boyfriend, or if I could finally get that car, you know, that has the air, that would be so nice. I'd feel so much better then. But in Georgia, that's true, you know. But the if-then mentality, and what God wants is to give us divine rest in his provision because God provides for his people. And then number three is fulfilling every role to fulfillment of God's highest purpose. You know, I remember when I was 13, and I talk about this because I cannot be unawed by it, but when I was 13, the Lord transformed my life in such a way. I was a believer, but I remember going to, to revival and I remember being in a revival service and I remember specifically going to the altar and the spirit of the Lord flooded me in such a way that it transformed my identity overnight. The Holy Spirit came into my life in such a powerful way. And what happened was, is I woke up the next day the same student to the same teachers, the same daughter to the same mom, all the things. And I woke up and I was transformed by the power of God in my thinking about who I was. And I remember stepping out of the car. I remember nothing else, hardly at all, but I remember stepping out of the car and I remember thinking, I am going to school and I have the spirit of the Lord alive in me. Like I can do anything, which is a big deal because I always felt like less very, very poor self-esteem. And I remember when, when the Lord came into my life in that way, it transformed my identity in such a way that I carried that through my whole life. I, I never could get away with it, away from it. I just, I loved what Jesus had done and I never wanted to forget. And I was always trying to stir that. It affected who I dated. It affected, you know, where I went. It affected what I did. It wasn't that I didn't want to do things or, or date or do all those things. But what it was, was I have a birthright and I know it and I believe it. And I know there's a bigger picture than what I can see. So Lord, because I'm putting you first, I'm going to put my ear to you and you're going to tell me what to do. And the Lord was faithful. And yeah, I, I fell, you know, and there were times where I did not do what the Lord wanted. I was more of a hermit. I would hide my faith a lot um, because I didn't want to be embarrassed. But it was my identity that carried me through. And then whenever I met Reagan, it was so awesome because I'm like, man, I met a guy who like knows who he is and I know who I am. And we, you know, like that's awesome. But I, there were a lot of guys before Reagan that had opportunity to date. And I'm like, well, maybe, maybe it's not the right time, strategically speaking. Maybe I wasn't developed enough. I wasn't becoming who God wanted me to be in those secret places. And so by the time I met Reagan, it was like, man, what a blessing, you know? And then when I became a mother, I had no clue what I was doing. I should have been incredibly insecure, but I was crazy enough to think I could do it. <laughs> no. But you know, I went into motherhood and I'm like, I know who I am in Jesus. And so when my daughter tells me I can be nothing like you, I can laugh and not cry. Maybe I cried a little, I don't know. 
but we are so much more than those things. Amen. And then performing for God and men to fellowship with him, which is the good news. Having relationship with Jesus. And then five is adapting to unquenchable culture and to being part of his kingdom. And here's the thing. Our culture is so vague, but so opinionated. The one minute it's telling us this is the answer. And then when you do it, then it's like, oh, how dare you? You were so wrong. You know, like it's a moving target. What our culture tells us to do and be. But the word of God stands from the beginning of time to the end of time. And it doesn't waver and it proves true. And so if we are going to know who we are, we have got to find it in Jesus. And if we are going to have the peace that passes understanding, it is going to be because our feet are planted in Jesus. Can we live a life, a good life outside of Jesus? Probably. They're nice people, right? But I want to be go strong. I want to go confident. I don't have to worry about my future. My eternity is set in him and my life is set in him. So would you stand? We're going to have a little bit of a response time here. You know, when we came to know the Lord and we, we gave our hearts to Jesus, we did so knowing that when we gave our life to Jesus, that we were saying, we're putting you first. We knew that. If you, if you had good teaching and you had an experience with the Lord, you knew that you no longer could be first. You had to be second. And every appetite that you had could not be met on this earth, but it had to be met in Him. But the problem is, is it is a fight every day after that to keep Him first. The enemy is so good at curating value. They have algorithms now even. What is this person drawn to? What do they like? I'm gonna put it in their feed. Toxic things all the time. And yet Jesus is saying, come to the secret place. Come to the quiet place. Come spend some time with me and let me see you. Let me see who you are. Let me see what you do. And let me speak truth into those places. Jesus loves you. So I'm gonna ask you, if you want God first, whether you're a mother, a dad, a single person, a married person, you know, whether you don't even know why you're here or whatever, if your desire Maybe it's for the first time to put Jesus first. Because you're like, I want to live a life where I know who I am based on the one who created me. So if that's your prayer, you can come down and make Jesus the Lord of your life today. But if you want to recommit first place, maybe you would say he is first place still. And you just want to declare that you're going to live your life continuing to put him first. I know for me, it's a struggle every day. My thoughts want to hijack my God first life, right? So if you want to say that prayer, I want to pray for you. So I'm going to ask you to come down. I'm going to say a prayer and Josh and the prayer of the praise team are going to sing a song, a declarative song. Okay. So come down. Well, Lord, as people come, Father, I wanna thank you for everyone, Lord, who has responded. I love hearing your word, but God, I love responding to your word. Lord, and I ask today that, Lord, you would touch the hearts of your people in a way that draws them into the place where you say, get alone with me, and then you'll get your reward. And the reward really is you, Father. I pray for every believer in the house today, God, that you would redirect any area of their thinking, Lord, any area of their life, Father, where they have partnered with worry and thought worry was gonna solve something. 
Lord, I pray that you would replace worry with a trust in you. Lord, that worry may come at us and it may get on our radar, but before we go the distance, it is so foreign because we have such a life of faith, Father, that we would redirect our thinking or in our quiet time with you. God, I pray for every person in this room, for every mother, Lord, who is going through a challenging season and her faith is being tested, God, whether she's a young mother, an older mother, the mother of adults, God, whatever. God, I pray for strength and hope to know that you love our children more than we do. If there's a father in the house, Lord, who, who once loved you and was passionate about you and now wants to be faithful, but is just tired because they don't know what to do. I pray, Father, that you would spiritually charge the batteries of your men to do the mission, Lord, that you called them to. Jesus, I pray for every um, marriage in this room, Lord, where maybe there's some things that feel like we've just lost our way in marriage or some love is lacking. Lord, would you allow them, Father, to fill the first place with you and to trust you and walk with you, Jesus. Lord, for every single person in this room, Father, who, who wants companionship, who desires companionship, Lord, would you allow them, Lord, to see the big picture and the birthright and the blessing. Lord, that they would not sell out, Lord, for a bowl of stew, Lord, for, for what's temporary, Lord, but can lead to brokenness. God, that they would put their hope in you. God, I pray for your people. Lord, stir in them a passion, stir in them a, a fire for your presence in their life. Lord, I pray that they would not be satisfied coming to church and going through motions. I pray for every believer in this house to be all in in a God first life. In Jesus' name, amen.